All right, before we get into the sermon today, if you'd remember to grab the attendance pad, it should be at the end of the aisle, and send that on down and give us a record of your attendance today. Thank you. If you are visiting with us, so glad you're here today. Uh, there are guest cards as well. You could drop them off in the foyer at our uh, guest table uh, and receive a gift from us. Uh, so anyway, thank you for doing that. Let's get into the word today. If you would turn uh, to Mark chapter 14. Mark chapter 14. We're coming out of the time of the Garden of Gethsemane, and uh, Jesus is about to be on trial, and Peter's about to be on trial as well, a trial of his own. Here's Mark chapter 14, verse 53. And they led Jesus to the high priest. And all the chief priests and the elders and the scribes came together. And Peter had followed him at a distance right into the courtyard of the high priest. And he was sitting with the guards and warming himself at the fire. Now the chief priests and the whole council were seeking testimony against Jesus to put him to death, but they found none. For many bore false witness against him, but their testimony did not agree and some stood up and bore false witness against him, saying, We heard him say, I will destroy this temple that is made with hands, and in three days I will build another not made with hands. Yet even about this, their testimony did not agree. And the high priest stood up in the midst and asked Jesus, Have you no answer to make? What is it that these men testify against you? But he remained silent and made no answer. Again, the high priest asked him, Are you the Christ, the Son of the Blessed? And Jesus said, I am. And you will see the Son of Man seated at the right hand of power, coming with the clouds of heaven. And the high priest tore his garments and said, What further witnesses do we need? You have heard his blasphemy. What is your decision? And they all condemned him as deserving death. And some began to spit on him and to cover his face and to strike him, saying to him, Prophesy. And the guards received him with blows. And as Peter was below in the courtyard, one of the servant girls of the high priest came, and seeing Peter warming himself, she looked at him and said, You also were with the Nazarene Jesus. But he denied it and saying, I neither know nor understand what you mean. And he went into the gateway, and the rooster crowed. And the servant girl saw him and began again to say to the bystanders, This man is one of them. But again he denied it. And after a little while, the bystanders again said to Peter, Certainly you are one of them, for you are a Galilean. But he began to invoke a curse on himself and to swear, I do not know this man of whom you speak. And immediately the rooster crowed a second time. And Peter remembered how Jesus had said to him, Before the rooster crows twice, you will deny me three times. And he broke down and wept. Father, would you be with us today as we look at your word, as we as we look at what it means to us, as we look at what it meant for Jesus to give this incredible confession of who he is and the unfortunate nature of Peter's denial. May we learn lessons from this passage that we would also apply in our own lives when we have opportunity to speak up. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. It was night in the garden and Jesus is betrayed by a kiss. It always seems like the deepest betrayals come with some false affection. There was a skirmish that started after that. Mark doesn't tell us, but we know it was Peter that drew his sword and struck off the high priest's ear. He's a fisherman, what can you say? And Jesus seems to quickly deal with that Heal the servant's ear. It's still dark. Maybe there's torches going. A little bit of light. But this is the hour of darkness. And they take him away for a trial at night. A trial at night is unusual. In fact, later rabbinic law would actually outright forbid trials at night. There seems to be something going on. There's there's this need to keep this out of the public view. 
so that Jesus' popularity doesn't save him for what they have planned for him. There seems to be the need to hurry the process up because this won't be the last trial that Jesus has. They need to get him to Pilate. They need him to go before the Roman court. Probably because Jewish people did not have the right to exercise uh, the, uh, the death penalty on a criminal. They needed the Romans for that. So there seems to be the need for speed and the need to keep this out of the public view. And so this council's convened, the Sanhedrin as they're called. It's a 71-member council, but... It's doubtful that they were all there that night. You probably gathered the ones that you could get together, maybe the ones that would be more favorable to the verdict that you needed. And so they're gathered. And in a trial, you got to have uh, witnesses. Every trial has witnesses. And so they call these witnesses, and one witness says, I know he said the temple was going to be destroyed, and he's going to raise it up. Now, that's a version of the truth of what Jesus actually said. But of course, it's not what he meant. He meant if you destroyed his body, he would be able to rise up in three days. But at the very least, you've got to admit that if you look earlier in the week, earlier in the week, Jesus does go into the temple, and there is a skirmish, there is a commotion. He's turning over tables, and he does say, you've turned this place into a den of robbers. So that is a statement against the temple in a sense. He is attacking their system of worship in a sense because it was corrupted. So you can see why they're trying to find witnesses that they can somehow prove that Jesus is anti-temple and anti-religion. The problem is, and Mark highlights this, even the witnesses that come forward, their stories don't agree and they're found to be false. That is a problem because uh, it says in the Old Testament law, Deuteronomy 17, 6, on the evidence of two witnesses or of three, the one who is to die shall be put to death. A person shall not be put to death on the evidence of one witness. You can't have one person stepping up and saying, I've got a story to tell, and everybody believes that one person, and then there's this death penalty given because of this one person. There needs to be more witnesses. So they got an issue. And maybe out of desperation... I think it could be desperation because all week long they've been setting traps for Jesus. Tell us, is it lawful to pay taxes to Caesar or not? And every time they set a trap, that whole week long, Jesus always had the perfect answer, the wise answer, the the answer that evaded the trap springing on him. But not this time. This time they say, What do you have to say to these things? Jesus is silent. I think his silence is defiant. You know, like, (laughs) you can hear for yourself, these guys don't agree. And I'm going to say more about his silence next week because he continues in this direction. But what I am struck by is what he does say. The trap has been set. Are you the Christ, the son of the blessed? Now, blessed is, is a euphemism for God. They didn't use the sacred name there, but they used this other word, the blessed. But what they're asking is, are you the Messiah? That's Christ. Remember, Jesus' last name isn't Christ. Um, it's, it's Messiah. That's what Christ means. And, and are you the Christ? Are you the Messiah, the Son of God? This is the first time in the Gospel of Mark that the phrase Son of God is used by a human being. It's used by Mark in the opening verses. It's used by the Father at the baptism of Jesus, speaking from heaven. It's used by demons who try to out Jesus' identity. And here it's a question. Are you the Messiah, the Son of God? The trap is ready. All Jesus has to do is be quiet, and, and he can just kind of avoid this, but he doesn't. He steps right into it, and he boldly says, I am which ought to have an echo of Moses in the burning bush. I am that I am. I am. I'd like to think that Jesus paused for a moment. As you heard me when I read the scripture, I don't know if he paused there, but man, that would be a big pause if he did. And then he says, and you will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds. 
You're going to see me one day for who I really am. You might not accept it now, but one day you will see it. And here's what Jesus does. He puts together uh, two Old Testament passages to create this image of who he is, this description of who he is. This is the first one. Uh, Psalm 110, verse 1. The Lord, that's Yahweh, Yahweh says to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool. So the Messiah is meant to be at the right hand of God. He's at the right hand. Now, Jesus, we talked about this a few weeks ago, by the way, so I won't rehash that whole argument for you this morning. But Jesus makes a note to say, why does David call the Messiah my Lord? Doesn't that mean the Messiah, the Christ, is something more than just a guy? Interesting. And then you get Daniel 7, 13 and 14. Here it is. Uh, I saw in the night visions, we've looked at this recently too. And behold, with the clouds of heaven, there came one like a son of man, and he came to the ancient of days and was presented before him, and to him was given dominion and glory and a kingdom that all peoples, nations, and languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion which shall not pass away, and his kingdom one that shall not be destroyed. That great rock that Nebuchadnezzar saw falling down from heaven in that vision that will never pass away. That kingdom's eternal. This is a Messiah that's God. He's the son of God. And Jesus walks right into the trap and says, that's who I am. Well, the high priest says, that's blasphemy. And he rips his garments. Now, I wish if I had a bad day, sometime I could just like rip my shirt, you know, like the whole Hogan thing, you know. Oh, man, that was a bad day, you know. (laughs) Wouldn't that be great? Okay, all right, all right. (laughs) Maybe not, maybe not. It would express my utter distress over whatever's happened that day. But, but, But I think when you think about the high priest doing this, obviously there's outrage He's maybe trying to model some distress, like, how could he say that? That's blasphemy. And now you have an offense that you can execute a guy for. Unless it's true, then they would be accused of blasphemy in a strange reversal. And Jesus is saying, one day you will know that what you're doing is wrong and what you're doing is blasphemy because I am this person. So, I wonder also if the, if the high priest tore his robes as a signal to the other people on the council, like, I've made up my mind. This is my verdict. He's guilty. He must be killed. And you ought to agree with me, and I'm just making it a little more dramatic. Do you get that impression? A little more dramatic. And then, why did I close my Bible? And then the suffering, then the suffering begins. You see it here, verse 65. They all condemn him. Some began to spit on him. They covered his face. They strike him. Prophesy, who hit you? Can you tell me the name? What's my name? And they struck him. And the guards received him with blows. Maybe it's ironic that Jesus predicted all these things were going to happen. Uh, look at this in Mark. Uh, Mark 10, 33, 34. See, we're going to Jerusalem, and the Son of Man will be delivered over to the chief priests and the scribes. They will condemn him to death. They'll deliver that, That's happening right now, by the way. They are condemning him to death. And then deliver him to the Gentiles. That's going to happen when they send him to Pilate. That's next week. And then they mock him and spit on him. That's happening right now. And then they're going to flog him and kill him, and after three days he will rise. Uh, So I say it's somewhat ironic that as they're striking him and saying prophesy, as they're mocking the prophet, they're fulfilling the prophet's prophecy. By the way, while this is happening, Peter's also fulfilling the prophecy about him denying What can I say about Jesus right here? And you know what? Uh, I've loved over the years sermons that compare all the trial details in all the Gospels, sermons that, that give us kind of this full picture. I mean, that wasn't the only trial he had that night, by the way. I mean, there's more details we could cover. 
But I am, in, I'm curious on what Mark includes here. Why does Mark give us what he gives us? I know it's not surprising because the whole, this whole sermon series this year, I've tried to say, why does Mark tell us what Mark tells us? In other words, why does Mark include the detail, verse 54, Peter followed at a distance right into the courtyard of the high priest. And he was sitting with the guards and warming himself by the fire. Why is it that when Jesus is under fire, Jesus is, or Peter's warming himself by the fire? And there seems to be this, it's happening at the same time. Jesus is having a trial. Peter's having his own trial outside. And I think Mark does it for a reason. To say, when you're under pressure and it's time to speak up for Jesus, it's time to speak and give a testimony to Jesus, to bear witness to Jesus. What are you going to do? Are you going to be like Jesus and boldly confess him? Or are you going to be like Peter and cowardly deny him? So my outline is kind of simple this morning. Uh, number one, Jesus gives the bold confession. All of us in this room that claim Christ are called not to be passive, but to actively and boldly confess Jesus as the Savior. Sometimes I feel like, especially educated people, they know what our claims are in the church, don't they? I mean, they, they, they know what we believe, somewhat. There's probably people you're going to meet that don't know that Jesus died for them. Those are people that might think that good works get you into heaven, which is not true. Some people are ignorant of the claims of Christ. Some people know it. And I find it harder sometimes to speak up with people that know it. Like, I know what you Christians believe. Jesus is the Savior. He died on the cross for sins. Yada, yada, yada. And I'm like, okay, they know. They already know. But, but, but Jesus here says it. He gives the bold confession. It gets him in trouble. And we're called to get in trouble with him and make the confession under fire. We're not called to be passive. We're called to be bold. When's the last time you boldly spoke about Jesus to someone who needed to hear it? When's the next opportunity you have to speak up? Peter, then, is the counterpoint. He's the opposite of Jesus in this story. Peter's the one that gives the cowardly denial. Like I said, simple, simple outline here. Jesus gives the bold confession. Peter gives the cowardly denial. Let's talk about Peter for a minute. He's warming himself by the fire. Must be a cold night, perhaps. And a servant girl sees him and calls him out. It's not, it, it, it's a young girl. It's not a high priest it's not a council of people that are hostile. It's a young person. And Peter collapses under the pressure. And his first response is interesting to me because he, he tries to play dumb. Verse 68, I don't know or understand what you mean. <laughs> what are you talking about? I'm with that guy. No, I'm not with that guy. I don't, I don't know what you're talking about. He plays ignorant, which plays into something we're going to say about Peter in a minute. Later, he denies him a second time after ignoring the first rooster crow. And then there's a third denial, and this one is the strongest. He began to invoke a curse on himself and to swear, I don't know this man of whom you speak. Um, the Greek, though, in this verse is not clear on who Peter is cursing. Obviously, the ESV translators and probably other translators uh, filled in the detail there with he invoked a curse on himself. Like, may God curse me to hell forever if I'm lying to you. I don't know that man. I'm not with that man. It could be that he just cursed Jesus, which would make his sorrow even more intense. By the way, throughout history, one of the things that's been done to Christians is when you want them to deny their faith, you ask them to curse Jesus. If you look at Book of Martyrs, other places, it's a will you curse Jesus? 
And when you don't, we kill you. He denied it, and he denied Jesus. To get our brains around this denial and thinking about the fact I've never been caught at a fire with a young person accusing me, what kind of denials do we take part in, or hopefully not take part in? The scripture gives a few examples of denials. I found three of them. I think they're worth talking about. Uh, The first way some people deny Jesus is denying him by their witness. This is Matthew 10, 33. Whoever denies me before men, I'll also deny before my Father who's in heaven. So we have an opportunity before people to testify to Jesus and we don't do it. Maybe a related cousin of that idea is I have every opportunity to speak up and I just remain silent. I'm not going to share Jesus. Maybe I'll stop short in denying him But I'm also not going to step up and boldly proclaim him. Denial by witness. There's also a denial by blasphemy. Uh, That would be 1 John 2.22. Who is the liar but he who denies that Jesus is the Christ? This is the Antichrist, he who denies the Father and the Son. So if you get mixed up in religions that deny that Jesus is the Son of God, that deny that he's the Messiah, we call that a heresy, That's blasphemy, and it's incredibly dangerous. So we don't get involved with Mormons, Jehovah's Witnesses, and others like them that would lower who Jesus is or seek to lower who Jesus is. In fact, blasphemy, like I tried to argue earlier, is actually more of what the high priest and the Sanhedrin is doing at this time. You're not the Christ, you're not the Son of God, and you're going to die for it. A dangerous, dangerous place to be, which is why we would warn anybody not to get involved in religions that bring Jesus down to less than the Son of God. The third one touches close to home, I think. Denial by works. This is Titus 1.16. They profess to know God, but they deny him by their works. They're detestable, disobedient, unfit for any good work. Sometimes it's that our lives are so contrary to the gospel. They're so contrary to obedience that we're denying Jesus by our works, by our life. It's not lost on me that if you talk about morality with people, there are certain moral issues of our culture that can get you in trouble. And it'd be easier to just deny those things than to actually stand up for morality. It'd be easier to just be quiet than to get yourself in trouble on the moral issues of the day and deny Jesus by our works or by our morality. That's a serious thing. And again, churches that morally compromise on these issues of morality, a serious thing. A denial by works. So here's my, here's my thing about Peter. I... He's the guy in the garden that struck off the ear. He's the guy that said, I will die with you. I will die with you. He's the guy that follows Jesus into the courtyard of the high priest. And he's the guy that says to a young girl, I don't know who that guy is. May God curse me or him. Who is Peter? And why does he do this? And why is it that we find, when we find ourselves under pressure, sometimes we're surprised at what comes out of our mouth? Let me offer three things, then I'm going to turn these things around and talk about how we can be more bold. In Peter's life, there is spiritual dullness. Throughout the book of Mark, how many times the disciples just not get it? Jesus says something, he does something, and they're like, I don't know what he's talking about. What does he mean? When you go through an extended time of dullness spiritually, you're setting yourself up to fail. I hope you don't fail, and I pray you don't fail, but when, when, you're, when you're out of the word of God and not in the scriptures, you're just asking for trouble because one day it's going to get hard and, and, and you're going to withdraw. There's also Peter's prideful boasting. I would never fall away. And the thing about prideful people, they never know they're prideful. They're they're, they're just just willfully blind. You ever try to tell someone they're full of pride? It never goes well. 
I don't even, I don't know how, I'm, honestly, I'm thinking, how do I do it? I don't know how to do it. Maybe you can help me. How, how do you do it? Because the moment you say, I detect pride, they say, no, not me. Jesus says, you will deny me three times. And you think Peter could say, well, Jesus said it, so I guess I'm going to do it. But he doesn't. And you'd think Mark made a point to say, after Peter's first denial, the rooster crowed the first time. You'd think he'd be like, oh, that's the signal. Stop! Now, now I, I, know, I know, Jesus prophesied it, it was going to happen. You can get into cause and effect, chicken or egg. I, I know, I know. But how many times does the Bible tell us what's going on in our hearts and it exposes it and we say, not me, not me. I'm better than that. Pride. And then finally, there's prayerlessness. I said this last week, I'm going to say it again. I don't think it's an accident that, that, that there's three times in the garden the disciples don't pray and Jesus calls them on it and Peter denied Jesus three times. I think there's a connection there. If you're not praying, you're weak and you're going to fall and you might say, well, I'm going to start praying. Right when I get tested, that's when I'm going to start praying. You're just not ready. You're not prepared and you're about to stumble. You may fall. So, um, fortunately, and I wanted to make this a very positive sort of message, I think the same failures that Peter showed us are also the ingredients for boldness. So let me turn those, two, those three things around. Here's what we need. We need a sharpness spiritually. Sharpness. Like, I know what God has said in his word. I know the promises that he's made. I know what he says about me. I know what he says about the mission. I am ready to go. I'm sharp. You also need humility. This is God's work. It's not my work. I have weakness. I have sin. I'm not better than you. You need humility to be bold. Boldness can get you in trouble. If you're willing to accept trouble, you're probably a humble person. Hopefully. Maybe. And also you need prayer. Three ingredients. What if you remove one of those ingredients from your bold witness? What do you have left? If you remove sharpness, what do you become? Let's think about that for a moment. If you're not sharp spiritually, then you're probably going to be directionally challenged. You know anybody like that? Gives bad directions? How do I get to your house? Well, you go up this road a ways, and then you uh, turn right at the stop sign. Wait, 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 left. Left at the stop sign, right? Yeah, correct, right, right, left. Turn left. Uh, go a little bit. And, and, and the people that do this, they always say this before they give you directions. Oh, it's easy. <laughs> it's easy. And then they tell you all these things. And, and here's what I do. And I'm sorry if I'm telling you what I do, but I think we all do it, right? I just say this. Give me an address. My phone will help me get there. You know, oh, but, but that, that, that GPS stuff doesn't get you right to our house. I've heard people talk. No, it hasn't failed me yet. So, you know, <laughs> I don't know. You people have failed me, but I said in the first service, I don't know what direction's north. Do you? Oh, there you go. Some of you succeeded right there, right? <laughs> Some of you succeeded. And, and God bless you. We need more of you in, 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 in the world. North, Right? Yes. So, um, directionally challenge people. And when you're trying to explain Jesus and you don't know the directions, it's going to be a big mess. You may have prayed about it and you may be humble enough to bring up the conversation with someone that you care about. But if you don't know what to say, it's going to be a jumbled up mess. You got to be sharp. You got to know what to say. I know the Holy Spirit helps us, by the way. Praise God. And sometimes my rambling mess does come out pretty good. uh, But... Don't be the directionally challenged person. Be sharp. Uh, Let's say you take out humility. What happens? You take out humility and you are just the ear chopper. Right? Am I right? I mean, Peter goes into the garden feeling pretty bold, right? I won't fall away and I brought my sword just to settle it if it comes to it. You come with clubs and spears, I got a sword He's a bad chopper, but listen, ears are made to hear. They're not made for us to remove. And when we come at people like we're superior, we're better, 
our morality is so great. We talk about morality. I know our morality is correct because of what the Bible says. But when we come across like self-righteous and we talk down to people or if we're rude and, and, and just mean-spirited about it, we're chopping off ears that would otherwise listen to us. So how are you going to share in a way that declares truth but in a humble sort of way? You might consider saying something like, let me tell you about my failures before we talk about your sins. That'll get you an audience. Because, let's just face it, one of the things people think about the church is we've got it all together. And we all came together because you're all the good people. Let's, we could present a different story and people will say, whoa, I'll listen to this. And my ears are intact as we go. Yes, the old ear chopper. Um, Let's say you remove prayer. You have humility. You want to share with somebody and you want to do a good job at it. And and, and you're sharp. You know what you're going to say and you're going to say it. But let's say you take prayer out of the equation of your bold witness. What do you have left? What are you in that moment? I love this one. Uh, This is my favorite one. Um, You are the tryhard. The young people go, aha. The old people are like, what? Um, uh, you Google it, try hard. It's one word. It's one word. It's not a real word, but it's one word. Um, a try hard is somebody that works, gives a lot of effort to something that really doesn't amount to much. Um, a couple examples. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Um, let's say uh, you get into a little, uh, a little football game over Thanksgiving. That's classic, right? A little football game over Thanksgiving. It's a nice day. And, 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 Uncle Bob's out there, and he just tackles you to the ground like it's a Super Bowl. And then he dances around and does a little celebration, hopefully not taunting. Uh, but, but let's say he does all of that, and you're like, it's just a football game. And that's little Johnny who's six years old. You shouldn't have tackled him, you know? It's a try hard. Uh, when you, pick, you play a soccer game, and they act like it's the World Cup. You know, I, I see this too. Sometimes I watch the kids play in the backyard and they're, and they're playing football and, and one kid is always like the kid that's like roughing the passer, you know, and they're calling all these like technical NFL rules and you're just like, just play football, kids. Just have fun, you know? I don't know. Uh, I had a, one more because I can't resist. I had a, I had a friend, uh, I thought about this in between the services. I had a friend who really loved video games. He was my age. I'm not into video games. That's just my, I, I'm not into it. But uh, he played uh, the, the Madden video game, and he would like, he was my friend. He's a good man. He's a good family man, too. But, but, but he would talk to me about his video game football, you know, and he would, he would talk about how his season was going. Well, next week I'm going to play the, the Jacksonville Jaguars, you know, and that's going to be an easier game, so I think we've got this. And I'm like, are we talking about a real season or are you talking, oh yeah, you're talking about your video games. Might make it to the Super Bowl this year. <laughs> like what? Stop, just stop. That's a try hard. <laughs> um, so you get in there, you know what you're gonna say, you got your script memorized, you're humble enough to know you need to have this conversation with somebody, you wanna do it the right way, but you got no power. You unplugged. You didn't pray about it. Now, fortunately, God can overcome that. And sometimes when I haven't prayed, he shows up anyway. And I'm like, that's grace. I don't deserve it. He's going to help me. Praise God. But how about it would be better to go in with some power because you prayed it through. And then you talked about it. And you see what the Lord does. Don't be a tryhard. Um, by the way, uh, just, here's my rabbit trail, right? Sorry. Not sorry. Uh, some people do their spiritual life like this. And when things get rough in your spiritual life, you say, oh, I just got to try harder. God wants me to do more. Serve in a, be- in a bigger way. If I read more verses, that'll fix it. Uh, verses are good. All that stuff. Serving's good. Worship's good. But this is a relationship. It's a back and forth between you and God. And the try harder doesn't get it done. It's the relational thing. It's the Holy Spirit in you. And you read your Bible so that God says, hey, look at that verse. See that? Work on that one. <laughs> you pray to him because it's a conversation between you and him. It's relational. 
So anyway, okay. Maybe that would save you a little bit of uh, grief over, you know, I just got to try harder. Uh, that's what I grew up with, you know. So uh, here we are at the end. Mark doesn't uh, leave us in a great place with Peter. He, I, think he, I think Mark did what he wanted to do here and what the Spirit inspired him to do. Are you going to be the bold witness or are you going to be the cowardly denier? Which one are you going to be? You can't be both. You're one or the other. You can't stay in the middle. You're one or the other. So who's the next person you need to boldly speak to? Here's how Mark leaves us, though. Uh, he broke down and wept, verse 72. It's an interesting word, broke down. I just call your attention to it because I, I found it interesting personally. Um, the word in Greek is epibalo, epibalo, E-P-I-B-A-L-L-O. It means to throw over or to cast upon. I'm not precisely sure what it's saying here. It could mean that Peter would, like ran away. Like, get me out of here. It, it could mean that Peter threw himself down. And I think that's where the translations go with it. He threw himself down and wept. And what Mark does give us, I think, is the beginning of repentance in Peter. Genuine, godly sorrow. I've messed up. And for all the times you didn't open your mouth, and I've heard people talk about this. I've heard people say, Niall, I had a chance to talk to that person and then they died. And I feel so bad. And, 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 and you can live with that guilt of what you could have done and should have done and people's eternal life is, you know, what, what is going on there? And yes, I trust God's sovereignty in those situations too. I'll put that out there. But on the human side of it, we feel that. But there's that epibalo moment of throwing yourself down before God and saying, give me the words, keep me sharp, keep me prayerful, keep me humble, and I'll, and I'll share this word with other people. I'll take advantage of the moments, and I will boldly bear witness. Let's pray. Jesus, uh, thank you for being our ultimate role model Most of us, I think, a lot of us, I confess me too, I'd rather not get in trouble culturally for saying something that will make people upset. And yet you've showed me, you've showed me how to make a bold confession. You've showed us what that looks like. And so I pray that you would give us an opportunity to walk in that way. Perhaps this week, Perhaps at the Thanksgiving table, perhaps you'll give us opportunity to speak for you. May we do it. May we do it. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen.